you made. Uh, so on Monday, September 12th, Eco Lunch is going to be held, and I don't have an Eco Lunch title, and I don't know if Alan's here. Don't see her. Didn't realize we didn't have a title for that. Uh, Thursday, September 13th, the Aspen Colloquium, which is held in 159 uh, Mulford Hall, will be given by Scott Stevens, and his title is Fire and Ecosystem Resiliency in California Forests. Uh, also on September 13th is the IB Seminar from 4 to 5, same time, so you don't want to go to the Espen Colloquium, you want to go to the IB Seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and the speaker is our own Han Lem, a uh, member of the IB faculty, and uh, his title is Location, 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 Genome Real Estate and Gene Regulation. And then uh, also on Thursday is Geo Lunch from 110 to 2 p.m. in Mul 103 Mulford Hall, and the speaker there is Michael Cohen. And the title is Hypothetical Geographies of the Electrical Distribution System. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> That's geo lunch. <laughs> okay. And uh, then uh, Friday, September 14th, is the Essig Brunch at 10 to 11. And the fishbowl, the LSB fishbowl, will be given by Jeffrey Lozier. Or Lozier. And uh, the title is Conservation Status of North American Bumblebees. Linking population surveys, pathogens, and population genetics. And then also on Friday, the wildlife, uh, there's going to be a wildlife fisheries and conservation biology presentation in Mulford, but I don't have a title for that. It's not announced. If anybody knows the title of that. It's about, about, about native fish, but I don't remember the title. Okay. So are there any other announcements before I introduce Anand? All right. So uh, today's speaker is Anand Varma. His title is Water and Ash, a Photographic Exploration of Patagonia's Wetlands and Volcanoes. And I think many of you already know Anand. He's actually been a member of the NBC community for, for quite a long time, at least since 2006. I think that's when I met you, when you were a student, when you were one of our, our uh, star students in IB 104. Uh, and I think since that time, you became interested in photography. I kind of faintly remember the IB 104 field trip to, to, uh, to Briones and you losing your point-and-shoot camera, right? Wasn't that you? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was one of the other students who lost their camera. But it was a point and shoot. But since then, he's become obviously an amazing photographer. He's done a lot of work with National Geographic, and uh, and then he's participated on a number of NBC field expeditions. And I believe that this is the result of another one of those uh, joint efforts, collaborations, where he joined Eileen Lacey uh, doing field work in South America. So he's going to to uh, give us a presentation on uh, on that trip now. So thanks a lot, Eileen. Can someone get the lights over there? You want the lights on for your full <laughs> <program of> exploration? <laughs> Is there one more that can go off? Right. So, thanks, Jim. Yeah, so my story is a little bit backwards in that I started working for National Geographic uh, before I was ever really interested in becoming a photographer. Um, so I was an undergrad here in the IB department, um, and I took. <laughs> I'd be 104 in 2006, and I took my camera on the field trips just as a hobby. I kind of wanted to take pictures of the salamanders and whatever we found. And the end of that semester, Sean Revito actually sent me an email that said, hey, this photographer is interested in an assistant. I know you're interested in taking pictures, so here's his phone number. And I thought that would be an interesting opportunity for field work, so I called up this guy. And uh, I started working for him on all kinds of projects in Sequoia National Park and Hawaii, all over the world. And by the time I graduated, I, you know, I, I had this plan to go to grad school to study marine, you know, community ecology, and I was pretty set on that for the longest time. But I couldn't really turn down these opportunities to go to South Africa and Costa Rica and all over the world. And so I decided to pursue photography, and I found that it's been a a great way to, to work on a lot of different fields, a lot of different projects, and still learn really cool things about natural history. So in 2010, I uh, applied for a Young Explorer grant from National Geographic to go to Patagonia. Uh, I'd wanted to go to Patagonia for many years, uh, but I wanted to work on, on an aspect of Patagonia that I didn't know much about, that I hadn't seen much about in the media. You see a lot of images of uh, glaciers of, of towering peaks, of cowboys, but coming from a <laughs> biology background, I wanted to know what kinds of natural history stories does this landscape have to tell. And as a student, I was interested in sort of landscape ecology. Why, why do landscapes look the way they do? What are the forces that drive that structure? And what's unique about this part of northern Patagonia is that it has 
the strongest rainfall gradient in the world. And so what that means is the land goes from very wet, temperate rainforest to very dry, arid steppe in a very short distance. And so water clearly plays a major role in, in shaping that landscape. And so I decided to follow that water by exploring the wetlands. And so what you'll see here is not really a quantitative analysis of hydrology or of wetland ecology. This is a visual exploration of a landscape. And I'll try to include as much interesting natural history and science behind that photography. So what, we'll start here on the western edge of Patagonia. This is an Andean valley, and this is all Valdivian temperate rainforest. And this is a valley that's been carved out by a glacier. And when water falls in this valley, it collects in the basin. It's trapped by this poorly draining clay, volcanic clay, and that keeps the soil saturated. And that's what allows this wetland to form. And in local term for this is Majin, and this is a Mapuche word meaning muddy place. So I'll use Majin and wetland interchangeably. And both of these terms are just very broad. They just refer to an area where the soil is flooded for part or all of the year. This is another Andean valley that's been carved out by a glacier. You can tell where the wetlands are by this lighter green area here. And it's a different color because that saturated soil excludes trees. Trees can't really tolerate that. And so instead you have a specialized plant community that, that loves that saturated soil. And you'll get things like these uh, rushes. This is a juncus. This is a flower of that juncus. And there's a number of orchids that really like that saturated soil. This is in the species, uh, or in the genus Gavilea. And so that plant community then attracts this insect community, like these dragonflies that come in to hunt in the open vegetation, to lay eggs in those standing pools of water. And those eggs will hatch out into these dragonfly nymphs, which just eat everything in their path. And these uh, harvestmen. So this is a relative of spiders, like these daddy long legs we have here, that come in from the surrounding forest to hunt in the wetlands. So that plant community attracts this insect and vertebrate community, and then you have other hunters like this painted tree lizard, a Lilimus pictus, that comes in from the surrounding forest to hunt in wetlands. And then with the right soil nutrients, this flooded soil causes these diatom blooms. So what you're looking at is a pool of water in the wetland that has allowed these microscopic creatures, these microscopic algae that builds a silica shell to form. And so what you're looking at is actually millions and millions of these diatoms that have floated to the surface. And these layers have caused sunlight to diffract. And so you get this sort of rainbow effect of colors just by these layers of stacked silica shells. And this tire tread pattern here is actually footsteps from an insect that's walked across that film to that blade of grass. So the scene you see here is only a few inches across. And another wetland-loving plant, um, lady slipper, Calciolaria biflora. And I was trying to photograph the flower, and I, this bug, it looks like a little midge, just happened to land on that. <laughs> so the water source in these, these montane wetlands comes from two things. It comes from precipitation, and it comes from glacial runoff. And these montane wetlands are sensitive because the, the basin from which they get water is, is very small. And so if you have any sort of disturbance, any kind of road cut or diversion project for a mine or something like that, that's going to have a dramatic effect on this wetlands. And this part of Patagonia has very little development, so the major problem is going to be climate change as that melts glaciers and changes the, the hydrology of, this, of the system. And this is one particular kind of wetland in the mountains, um, and this is a peat bog. So what peat bogs are is a, where the soil chemistry has prevented breakdown of organic material. So you have this accumulation of organic material that doesn't break down, and it actually acts as a carbon sink, an atmospheric carbon sink. And what the UN did a study in 2007 that shows that 10% of greenhouse gas emissions can be offset, could be offset 
just by the restoration and protection of peat bogs worldwide. The important thing here is if that water balance gets disturbed and that soil doesn't remain flooded, it'll start to dry out, that organic material starts to break down, and that carbon sink turns into a carbon source. So here's a close-up look at that peat bog. All this red stuff here is sphagnum moss, and this little seedling here is a cypress, a native cypress called Pilgerodendron viviferum. And this used to be a much more widespread species, but it was over-harvested for its rot-resistant wood. And now, at least on the Argentine side, uh, only is found in these peat bogs. So we're going to leave the mountains, and we're going to go just 35 miles east of that. And going 35 miles east of the mountains, you get you go from 4,000 millimeters of rain a year to just 400 millimeters of rain a year. And what that means is there's no longer enough water in the landscape to support trees, except for these native mite den and a few introduced willows that are only growing in this wetland. And this area is called the ecotono. It's ecotone. It, it just means transition. And it's this is a transition between the mountains and the steppe. And you have diversity represented by both. Um, representative of both systems. And the, the, but the, the process that creates these wetlands is the same. This old glacial valley with poorly draining clay soil that's trapping that moisture and allowing these lush grasses to form. And you can start to see the contrast between this wetter basin, wetter wetland here, and this dry, crusty steppe surrounding it. So if you were to take a walk around the edge of this wetland, you'll find these little burrows about three or four inches in diameter that are made by chupatucos. <laughs> so this is what Eileen Lacey studies. And if you're familiar with her work, you'll know this is an interesting species because they live in social groups. Julia came just the right time. <laughs> <laughs> so the chupatucos live in social groups. The females will live in colonies together and cooperate to raise young. And you know, that comes at a trade-off. You know, why, why would you stick together and, and give up some of your energy and time to raise somebody else's young? And why is that different from a sister species where they all live individually? And one of the ideas that, that um, Eileen has suggested for why this species has, has developed the social behavior is the limitation of their habitat. They only live in this part of Patagonia, they only live in the Ecotono, and they only live at the edges of these wetlands. They can't live in, inside because the flooded soil would, would flood their burrows. So it, with such a limited habitat, maybe there's a, a balance between you know, dispersing and being able to put all of your energy into your own young versus the risk of not being able to find a place to burrow. And you'll find ground nesting birds like this uh, Rufus back negrito that's using this dense vegetation to hide its nest. And Patagonia has its own species of leaf cutting ant. And like the tuco tuco, it doesn't live within the wetland, it lives along the edges where it can burrow into the drier soil. It comes into these wetlands to harvest these lush grasses. And if you're not familiar with leaf cutting ants, they're not actually eating this, these grass. They're harvesting it, and then there's a whole different cast within the colony that's uh, raising fungus off of this grass and feeding it on the fungus. And this is a tarantula hawk. So this is a wasp that has caught, uh, looks like a wolf spider here. And it's not going to eat that spider, and it's not going to kill the spider. It's going to drag it off, and it's going to bury it underground with its legs inside, with its eggs laid inside. So when those eggs hatch, these baby wasps will actually eat their way through the still living spider. And those babies actually know to avoid the vital organs of that spider to keep it alive for as long as possible. And here's another tarantula hawk. And this is a female, you can tell by its ovipositor there. So there's a, a number of interesting insects, especially these aquatic insects in the wetlands. And this is a predaceous diving beetle in the genus Rantus. And 
What's cool about this species is this silvery substance back here. So what this is, is actually a bubble of air. So what the species has is a special hairs at the tip of its abdomen that can trap air when it's at the surface. So then when it's diving below the surface on hunting, it can actually breathe through this, essentially, scuba tank attached to its butt. And this is another wetland-loving orchid that spans from the mountains out into the steppe. So it's one of these things that, that represents this um, ecothona very well because it's, it, it, it's from these different habitats. And this is uh, Thorea magellanica. <coughs> this is an ecotone wetland just after a storm. This is actually Eileen's field site, the Estancia of Rincon Grande. So we're going to go another 200 miles east. So now we're dropping from 400 millimeters of rain to about 150, 175 millimeters of rain. The diversity in these wetlands is very similar to the ecotone. The main difference is the contrast between the wetland and the surrounding landscape. You can start to see this is a very different system than this. And as that landscape dries out, it's leaving these bathtub rings of minerals along the edges. And there's very little surface water actually in these wetlands. So you can walk across here and your shoes would still be dry. Most of the water is actually still underground. But if you do want to find a spring, if you do want to find a fresh source of surface water, you'd look for this plant. This is a mimulus, a monkey flower. It's the same genus as the sticky monkey paw that's throughout Tilden and East Bay. And uh, the, the ranchers will use this to try to find sources of fresh water for them to drink and for their animals to drink. And you can pull it away and there'll be a, str a spring underneath. And what's cool about this is also there's very little you can grow out in this step. There's no vegetables, there's no, every, everything, the tomatoes, the lettuce, everything has to be shipped in from somewhere else. But the family I was staying with actually showed me how to collect this. You chop it up with some vinegar and salt and it makes a really good salad. And at night, you'll find these toads, spinulosis, that hang out at those springs as well. <coughs> this is a rock viscacha. So this is a species that doesn't live in these wetlands, but it'll live in these rocky outcrops alongside the wetlands. And it'll come down at night to actually feed on the grasses and, and, and drink from the wetlands. Another view of that rock viscacha. It is light work, yes. And in this, in this case, enough water has accumulated to, to keep this area flooded throughout the year, and that becomes a really important feeding and nesting site for birds. This is a coot nest, and the coot has used this aquatic vegetation to build a floating nest. <coughs> and then in those areas where those lagoons dry up, it leaves this really salty layer behind on the surface. There's only one species, this distichless grass, that can uh, survive in that salty conditions. But it's not just these native species that are depending on the food and water in these wetlands. It's livestock as well, which means people are really tied to these wetlands. So on this left-hand side, this greener stuff, this is the wet meadow, the wetland. On the right side is this arid steppe. And the important distinction is this has 10 to 20 times the productivity, 10 to 20 times the amount of food for these livestock is that. And so the value of the land is actually based on the size and quality of these wetlands. And more so than cows, it's really sheep that drive the economy of, of rural Patagonia. And the two ranches that I visited, this is Estancia Porchin Chacobuco, the previous image was from Yukiche. Those people understand that careful preservation of their land is really necessary for their long-term prosperity. But even with that attitude, you still have issues that, that complicate the preservation of, of wetlands. One, a lot of people lease their land to short-term interests. So you have a rancher that comes in that wants to maximize their meat production and their wool production in a couple of years, and they have no interest in balancing that with a long-term sustainability plan. And the other issue is when you have a spike in wool prices, even these very careful 
ranches have an incentive to overstock with the idea that, okay, next year we can cut back a little bit and let the, let the wetland recover. But if that coincides with a drought year, then you start to do damage that's very difficult to reverse. And in the worst case scenario, you end up with this. And so this is in a community called Mamolchoike in, in one of the driest parts of, of Patagonia. And basically decades of poor management and overgrazing has led to basically a permanent state of desert. So this is a process of desertification, of drying out the landscape. And so what happens is, you know, up until this point, I've talked about water as this necessary you know, preserving resource. But that's when you have grass and vegetation to stabilize the soil. You strip away the grass, and then all of a sudden, wind and water become destructive forces. So as they start to cut channels in this bare soil, then those channels allow water to drain more quickly and you have a feedback cycle that leads to this or this where what all, the only thing that's left are these unpalatable chukiraga plants and everything else has just been blown out. And this is a really difficult situation to address. It's a really difficult situation to reverse and it's happening on different scales and at different rates all across Patagonia and all across the world. And this, this was my Young Explorer project. This was to look at the biodiversity of wetlands. And I left with these images in mind thinking, well, how do you address this problem? I mean, 90% of Patagonia's land is privately owned. And you can't just go around telling people that you, know, you can't raise sheep. I mean, sheep are such an integral part of the history of the diet of the economy. You can't really. It, there's not really a simple solution to this. But then six months after I left, something happened to sort of change that equation. And this is the uh, Pujewe Cordon Cauje Volcanic Complex. It erupted on June 4th of last year. And I didn't really know what this meant. It, it wasn't really a clear connection to my project. I didn't understand what it meant for the wetlands, what it meant for for the ecology of the landscape, but it was happening just directly west of all these regions that I had visited. It was dumping ash all over Eileen's field site, all over these ranches I had visited. And with Eileen's help, I went back just to see what was happening. I didn't know what, what the answer would be. This is another view of that eruption. And so I went with the idea, with, with sort of this biologist perspective to start with. Okay, what is this doing to the natural landscape? What's it doing to the plants and animals? And right next to the eruption, it's pretty drastic and pretty clear. I mean, it's just dumping, this in this case, 12 to 14 inches of ash and rock on everything. The forests are all dying. The understory, interestingly enough, was surviving. So this is a couple of plants that have been ex excavated seven months after the eruption, and they're still green. They're still sending out flowers. And in this case, what had happened is that ash came down in uh, Patagonia's winter. And so all these plants are used to be covered in snow and be dormant in the winter. And so this ash came on top of the snow, the snow melted, and they just remained in their dormant state waiting to be exposed to light. It's unclear how long they could stay that way, but for the short term, they were still green. And the Tucos, the Tucos were having a bad year. Um, in this case, this is a lactating mother that's been so stressed through lack of food that she's starting to shed all of her hair. But you know, the interesting thing is this is not the first time that Eileen had seen this. She'd seen this in other drought years and other times of environmental stress. So they're having a rough time, but they weren't going extinct, which the introduced species were having a different, this is a different story. So the sheep were having a much harder time dealing with this than the native wildlife. In this case, uh, I went back to Estancia Yukiche and they had lost 50% of their sheep right off the bat. I mean, they just starved through lack of access to the, to the grass. It was covered in inches of ash and they just died from starvation. I visited about six months after. I went back in December, and there were still animals that were dying from various illnesses. 
and on top of that, all of their wool was contaminated with ash. So ranchers typically lost about 50% of their herd, and then all of the ash was, all of the remaining sheep were worth about 50% as much because of this ash, and it cost twice as much to shear. So it was a major economic problem. But even more than that was how, you know, even, even past an initial die-off, these ranchers were having to supplement food for all their animals. So this is Carmen Crespo, she's the owner of Yukiche. She's bottle feeding a lamb that had lost its mother, and she's sitting on all these sacks of feed. And there's no such thing as a feedlot in Patagonia. Nobody, she, she's 67 years old, she grew up on this ranch, and she has never had to buy a bag of feed in her life. So all of a sudden, this is a major economic burden that nobody planned for. And it's only people like her that have a big enough operation that can sort of afford to get by for a couple of months, whereas the smaller ranchers, they were really just out of luck. So this is Carmen again with um, all of the lambs and ewes of that year that are penned up. And this is also another very unusual scene. Normally they're out grazing, and by this time enough of that ash had been pushed around that there was grass available, but she couldn't let them out because the other issue that was going on is half the sheep were gone, and all of the introduced European hare had died off, or a vast majority had. So the predominant predator in this landscape, these foxes, are now getting desperate. So you have this interesting kind of Lotka Volterra dynamic going on where in a normal year they would use, lose a few lambs, they'd set a few traps, it would be manageable. And now these foxes are getting so desperate that they would lose all their lambs unless they keep them penned up next to the house and feed them the supplemental grain. So it's a little makeshift pen there in the barn. This is Julio. So Carmen lives on this ranch basically by herself and has the help of one gaucho to feed what used to be 4,000 animals and now it's down to about 1,000. And she couldn't afford to keep feeding all of the lambs and all of their mothers so as soon as she could she separated the, the ewes, put them back to pasture. The adults could sort of fend off the foxes a little bit better. But this is much earlier than she would have done in a normal year. And so what she's done here is she's injecting all of these lambs with vitamins. And you know, she injects a couple, two or three, and then the syringe gets clogged up with blood and skin. So she's cleaning out the syringe with her teeth. And then moving her sheep from one paddock to the other. And Patagonia is already a very dusty place to begin with. So all this ash was not helping the situation. And this is Julio going out on uh, one of his weekly patrols of, of the ranch. And all this haze in the background, that's all ash that's just been kicked up by the wind. So in windy days, it would be like that, just sort of gray as far as you could see. On, on calm days, the ground would heat up and you'd get these thermals forming and you'd get little dust devils like this that, that are pushing the ash around. So. When I got there, seven months after the initial explosion, the, the output of that volcano was much smaller than it was in the beginning, but the fact is that the ash that's already in the landscape, even if it had cut off that day, was still going to be remobilized and still going to be in that environment for five, six years in the future. And there's a flock of sheep heading out into a dust storm. And Julio taking a break after a day in the wind. And preparing a very typical barbecue of um, asado of lamb. So it wasn't just the, the ranchers that were affected by this. This is this uh, rural community of Hakobasi. This is the closest town to Yukiche. And again, about 300, 200, 200 to 300 miles east of the Andes and about the same distance from the closest big town. And so this is a family that's waiting for medical care. So because this community had gotten hit, the government has these mobile health trailers that it can deploy out into these rural communities. And so these are just these trucks that are full of doctors, and they're waiting to, uh, to get seen by them. Inside, there's people. There were pulmonologists and, and 
uh, in this case optometrists, and these guys were actually, they were doing eye exams and they were handing out um, pairs of eyeglasses. This is the only trailer they let me inside because there weren't any patients in here. And what's interesting about this is, you know, I go to get a pair of glasses in Berkeley and you get your eye exam and they, you pick out a frame and they send it off to somewhere and it takes whatever 10 days for them to carve out your lenses and get back to you. And these guys were producing 100 pairs of glasses a day in this trailer. Just there's a little carving machine back there. The other side of it was the optometrist doing eye exams. It was, it was impressive what they were able to do. And they didn't just send doctors, they sent psychologists as well. So this is the school gymnasium and you have basically a community support group here that's talking about what they felt like when the ash first came, what they felt like now, you know, how to deal with these issues. And you know, this was a really interesting scene for me because when I originally made some phone calls to my friends in Patagonia, and I was trying to figure out what was going on, what was this volcano doing, what did it mean? A lot of people told me, okay, go out to these rural communities. There's people that are losing their way of life, that are abandoning these rural communities for the city. And that's kind of what I expected to find, was to go here and find somebody that had lost their ranch and were planning on moving to the city. And instead, I found scenes like this where people, you know, there was a woman here, everybody's kind of going through and talking, talking about their story, and someone stood up and said, hey, I don't care about this ash. I'm not going to wear a mask. We deal with these problems every day, and this is just another one of them. And, you know, this is what we've been dealing with for generations, so we're going to deal with it and move on. And so that was, that was an interesting turning point to show that this is really much more of a resilient community than, than a, a, a desperate community. So this is a psychologist from Buenos Aires, and they're just sort of talking through all the issues that people were feeling and, uh, and how to deal with that. And I feel like an even better sort of scene to show the resilience of this community is if you watch the kids. I mean, there's ash all over the place. There's dead sheep all over the place. It's all blowing everywhere, and you can't see anything, and they're still out in the street playing soccer or goofing around in their pool. And I thought this was an interesting scene as well. So, you know, here's an ash storm blowing in. And the way this community is, is dealing with this is these, with these water trucks. They're just dumping water on the street to keep the ash out. But the problem is this is six years into the worst drought of anyone's ever remembered. And so they're actually using 100,000 liters of water a day to try to fight the ash, but by morning all that water is evaporated and the ash is still blowing around. So I don't know where they're getting all that water or how long that could last, but this guy doesn't care, he's just going to blame it. it <laughs> and so this is, uh, this is the guy that drives the water truck. And he let me kind of tag along for the day. And, and you can see the winds picking up. The town of Hakobashi is back here, we're kind of on the outskirts. And this cloud of ash is what's been blown up by the wind and it's moving in, moving in for the week. And this image, this is what actually ties this whole volcano back to my original story about wetlands and, and, and ecology. So this is the same wetland I showed you earlier in, in the presentation, that, that wetland in Yukiche. And what you see here is it's, it's covered in ash. And so again, I came back, I came here thinking Okay, here is this singular catastrophic, catastrophic event. What does that mean for the future of Patagonia? Does this change how people can make a living? If, if sheep are dying, does this change the, the direction of Patagonia? But when you think about it, you know, all the Andes are volcanoes. And they, they go off every couple of years and they dump ash everywhere. And that volcanic clay that trapped the water in the first place, that all came from a volcano to start with. So all of a sudden this becomes part of a longer story, part of a longer process, that yes, people are suffering in the short term, but really this is more of a process of rejuvenation than it is of destruction. Because I started talking to some of the, the ecologists that are studying wetlands, and they're saying, you know, this is, this is six years into the worst drought, but these majines, these wetlands, are greener than we've ever seen them. So what's happening here is actually this, volcanic tephra, all this ash and rock, 
is actually acting as a moisture barrier. So it allows rain to percolate through, but it prevents water from evaporating out of it. So what you have is half the grazing pressure and a way to maintain the moisture in that soil. And all of a sudden, we have a way to preserve these wetlands. And you know, there's this idea that you know, volcanic ash is, is like fertilizer. And that's not really true. It does have a lot of phosphorus in it, but that's mostly inorganic phosphorus that's not biologically available. It has to be weathered down. It has to be uh, broken down by other enzymes. And so really, it's this, this process of maintaining the moisture that allows these, these wetlands to thrive in this condition. And another way to, to sort of think about that, that process, so this is an image, satellite image from NASA that uh, the Nature Conservancy showed to me my first year when we were talking about issues of overgrazing, of desertification. And what it shows is all these point sources. This is farther north in Argentina. This is not in Patagonia. But it shows the same idea that you, know, you have overgrazing and then a windstorm will pick up and push all of that topsoil out into the Atlantic. And originally I thought about that and I thought, well, you know, that's kind of a one-way trip. You know, what do you, what do you do about that? But then you look at an image of Pujewe, and I mean, that's the Pacific, and that's the Atlantic. That's a lot of material <laughs> to come back and, uh, and re replenish that topsoil, essentially. So um, I have a little bit of extra time, so I was going to go through some um, of the behind the scenes of, of my field work. Let's start with this little time-lapse that I took of that volcano. Well, is it going to play? Oh, it's not playing. Okay. Oh. So what you see here, this is the lava field here. It's a very different kind of lava than what you see from like Hawaii. It's a much more viscous solid structure. And these are all off-gassing of that volcano. And so this is, this is a tiny fraction of what happened in July 4th. I, I'm about three miles from the vent here. And uh, the images you see from the, the first couple weeks, it's you know, thousands more times the output of what you see now. Switch back here. Is that daytime or nighttime? This is nighttime, so you yeah. can see stars yeah, out see. here. So that's from about midnight to 3 a.m. Chacabuco. What was amazing about this place is like I could show up like you I mean, Ch Chacabuco. I kind of had a connection through Eileen. I could I could get uh, the name of the manager and sort of timidly ask for permission. And and uh, you know when I got there, they were just sort of like, yeah, where do you need to go? Yeah, ask that guy. He'll give you a horse. Go wherever you want. Stay as long as you want. Here's a house. Here's the key to the house. <laughs> like, go for it. <laughs> and in, in Yukiche, it was basically the same thing. I showed up on these people's doorstep. You know, I studied Spanish in high school, but that was about it. And they had no English. And I'm kind of like, National Geographic. And they're like, what? <laughs> what do you want to do? Do you drink mate? <laughs> OK, you're fine. Whatever. Do it. <laughs> so that was, it was really a fantastic experience. And so this is, this is this family. This is her grandkids, Carmen's grandkids. And so I stayed at this house, this ranch house. I'm trying to photograph, I think, that little um, mimulus, the monkey flower. And they got really into like catching frogs and finding flowers for me. <laughs> this is Camila and Valentin. And that day, so the, there's that <laughs> photograph of those cows coming in. And really, this, Julio is the only full-time employee of this ranch. And so there's this one other guy, a neighboring kid who was interested learning these skills and so it's basically the two of them that were in charge of of rounding up all these cattle 
and in this case, they're branding the cattle and and um, and castrating them. And so I was taking photos of this whole process, and I kind of felt bad because you know a couple hours into this, these guys are getting really tired, and I thought, well, I should try to help. <laughs> so they taught me how to lasso things, and and up until this point, this is probably five days into my stay there, everybody's super warm, very friendly to me, except for Carmen. She's perfectly polite, but she, she's kind of keeping her distance. She's kind of hard to communicate with and kind of skeptical of me in the first place. But when I lassoed this cow, <laughs> and I, you know, um, Julio showed me how to like tie up its legs and I'm holding it down and she comes up to me with like beaming smile and shakes my hand. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> From then on, I was part of the family. She was like, cooking me my favorite meals like my grandmother does in, in, in India. And that was, that was great. And so this was my setup for trying to get to this volcano. Um, that tent originally had poles, but it was just heavy, so I just dumped the pole somewhere in the forest, and I just I would wrap myself in this kind of tarp burrito, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it kind of worked. I mean, the problem was that ash was the ash is actually pretty nasty. So basically, what it is is ground glass, and uh, it's not really clear what that stuff does to your lungs. Uh, so I would sleep with these respirators on. <coughs> not the most comfortable thing to do but um, you know there's some kinds of ash that's called uh, cristobalite this is long shards of glass that basically ask, acts like asbestos and in this case this test had shown there's no cristobalite in that ash but nobody really knows what these little particles will do to you in the long term theoretically it does the same thing which is it irritates your lung tissue which causes scar tissue to form and the lungs don't really work anymore. So, you know, there's, it's a process called silicosis, and it happens to miners, it happens to people that work with ceramics, who work with them over a lifetime. There's no real evidence that a volcanic event has caused silicosis in a population, but it also hasn't really been studied. So, we don't really know what's going to happen to those people that have to breed this every day, and will have to breed this for years. Even now that the volcano has stopped erupting, there's so much ash in the environment. Um, it, you know, that's kind of scary. And so I talked to I talked to one of these volcanologists about okay, what are the risks of going there? I don't I don't know anything about volcanoes. I don't know if they're just going to get swallowed by lava or whatever. But he said, okay, look, from our tests and from our information, you're not you're not going to have to worry about bubbles of sulfur gases, um, you know, killing you or or lava exploding all over the place. What you're going to have to worry about is visibility. So if you get close to this thing, the wind kicks up, you're not going to be able to find your way back. I thought, okay, well, I got goggles, I got this respirator, and I got a GPS. So worst case scenario, I can just follow my little track back to my campsite or back to my car. What I wasn't counting on was that I couldn't read the GPS when I was trying to get out of there. This is after I had left this dust storm. This is getting better, but in it, you know, your goggles get covered in ash and your glasses get covered in ash and I couldn't see anything. And so basically I would just shut my eyes and use my hiking pole like a blind person and walk a hundred meters and then smack myself in the face enough to, to like be able to read this GPS to see how far off track I was. And uh, that was probably the most miserable four hours of my life. <laughs> and so I get out of this, I'm, I'm coming out of this ash storm and I find these two German tourists in the other direction with no mask and no goggles and they're like, where's the volcano? And I'm like, this is four hours of hell here, you know, this is the worst conditions I've ever seen and you guys don't have any water, there's no water up there, they didn't have any water. So I convinced them to turn around. And so we're hiking back down the mountain and I see three more guys coming up. One of them has like a bandana around his face and they have sunglasses on, I think. Oh boy, and the more tourists that are going to get themselves killed. And I sort of go into my lecture about like what the conditions are up there and this is not a good day hike to do and go find some other place to go. And they're all kind of like nodding at me, smiling, clearly not taking me seriously. And finally I asked them, well, what are you guys doing here? And they're like, well, we're all volcanologists and we're here to take samples. <laughs> like, okay, I guess I'm not going to convince you to not come. And it turns out this eruption is it's called a rhyolitic eruption. It's only happened three times in the last hundred years. 
And nobody knows why they create this much ash. Nobody's really studied this kind of eruption before. And so they were really excited about going up there and setting up video cameras and just taking observations and taking samples. And so I asked them, you know, I had these goggles and masks and they were wearing these funny bandanas. And I said, well, do you guys have this protective gear? Like, oh yeah, we have something just like that. But we left it in the truck. <laughs> so I just gave them all my stuff. I was getting out of there the next day anyway. So, um, you know, somebody once told me that volcanologists have the highest mortality rate of any scientific field. And now I know why. <laughs> <laughs> that was not fun. <laughs> that was nine months ago, and I don't think my lungs have quite recovered. <laughs> so I was trying to, you know, I knew I, my, this project was originally about wetlands, and I wanted to show this contrast between the wetlands and the surrounding landscape. I knew I needed some way to take aerial photographs. And so if you hire an airplane, it costs about $500 an hour. And my grant budget was $5,000, and so that had to last me three months. There's just no way I can hire a plane. So I hired a paraglider pilot, which is a lot cheaper and a lot more fun. <laughs> but that wasn't really that effective either, because you have to wait for a hot day, and you have to wait for all these conditions, and then um, you don't really have a lot of mobility. It's like, okay, I want to take a picture of that. And they're like, yeah, you can't go over there. There's no, there's no thermal over there. So that wasn't that effective. Uh, so I came up with another method here. And I made a little film about it, so I'll show you how that works, and hopefully, oh man, this is, my program's not working here, so let me switch out of here for a sec. so I shouldn't go over, but uh, <coughs> I seem to have lost power to the speakers, but there's no light on. Billy, are you still here? No, Billy. Else, none of this would have 
been possible without Eileen's help. From the beginning, I mean, from I wouldn't have gone to Patagonia without her. She helped me write my grant. She helped me get in contact with all these biologists in Argentina. She helped fund my second trip. Uh, so I really owe a lot to her. I'm, sad, I'm sorry she couldn't be here today. But uh, uh, and and beyond that, I wouldn't be a photographer if it weren't for the MVZ, if it wasn't for 104. So yeah, I mean, this place means a lot to me. I'm trying to stay close by even now that I don't have an official connection here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, this isn't the last you'll see of me, I think. <laughs> but if anybody has any questions. Yeah. Can we get the lights? Yeah, so I know some people are going to have to, to leave to go to class if they have one o'clock classes, and we'll allow those people to go. But um, And then afterwards, if we have questions for Anand, we'll be happy to take them. Okay, so can you describe your kite setup and how you were able to get those photographs? Yeah, so there's a guy on campus, uh, Chris Benton, an architecture professor. And he has the best information for how to set up a uh, kite photography system. If you Google it, I, I was kind of I, I read some article I think in the New York Times a few years ago about yeah. weather balloons and using weather balloons for aerial photography. So that's where I started, and that really doesn't work in high wind conditions. So then I looked at kite photography. I'd sort of seen it on the web before, and this guy Professor Benton has the best information about how to get started, what tools to use. And there's actually a big community online that uh, I bought a little kit from this guy in Pacific Grove, and I could. I showed up at his office hours and asked like what gear I could use, <laughs> and so it's a very simple kite. There's no frame, uh, and you just need enough wind that's stable enough. And then I took I took my old camera that I that's probably the one I took on my 104 trips. This is my first SLR, and uh, there's ways to basically patch in all of these other sort of hobbyist tools. And so I had a way to transmit video signal. So every time I took a picture, it would transmit it to portable DVD player I had strapped to my neck, so I could see this picture. I could uh, control aperture and shutter speed through a little chip that this guy in Finland had designed in his basement, and so they were able to send signals through a USB cable, so I could do all these through a radio control um, up to about 500 feet. Now, 500 feet of line, uh, probably the highest I got the kite was maybe 200 feet. Mm -hmm. And I could fit all that in my, back in my backpack, so. How do you trigger the Sure. It's all through this, this radio little radio control. And so through a radio signal, I can take a shutter, I can record video, if my camera can take video, I can change the, the aperture settings. And since I have this video feedback, I can see everything that's on the back of the screen. So I know what my settings are, I know how many pictures I have left, what the battery life is. And um, The video is actually videotaping the, the viewer screen on well, the back of the camera? No, no, in, in this case, so it's like a video out. Like any VC, uh, yeah. video camera, you can plug it into your TV because it has a little video out cable. So I just connect that to a wireless uh, transmitter. It's all run by a 9-volt battery. And then I can change the angle of, of angle and rotation of the camera. And since it's connected to two points on the line, it's fairly stable. Uh, and so if I can take a picture, and if it's not the right height, I can adjust it. And everything is sort of self-leveling. So it, it worked out. Surprisingly well. Um, it's not the most reliable system. Um, so there's always, it's never like, okay, this event's going to happen. I'm going to use my kite to take pictures because the wind's got to be going in the right direction. It's got to be strong enough, but not too strong. I tried to photograph my sister's wedding two weeks ago at Bernal Heights Park. I pulled out that whole system <laughs> and the, wind, the gust of wind came and broke my line and it landed on somebody's roof. <laughs> well, just the kite. I didn't lose a camera, but it's like, well, sorry guys, that didn't work out. So there's a, it's, 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 if you can afford a helicopter, go with a helicopter. <laughs> but I couldn't do that, so. That's, How many that's shots cool. did you take with the kites to get the images they showed us? A lot. So it was typically, I could get probably four, 800 pictures before I had to pull it down and change batteries. And yeah, I easily took 10,000 pictures. Wow. Because a lot of times you're just holding the button down. 
because the, the wind is unstable enough that the camera's dang, dangling around. Sometimes it's like spinning 360 around. The plane. And that's when you're just like, oh god. And then you can see the little Velcro gears. It wasn't meant to be Velcro. I mean, those used to be real gears that popped off at some point. And I just had to use what I had. And it turns out Velcro makes for decent gears because it attaches and releases you know, well enough. So it's it's a hard, it's a, it's a system you don't have that much control over and. You know, if you're moving fast, if you have to have enough light so that you can run it at 500th of a second to keep it from being blurry. But the most interesting scenes are usually at dawn or dusk or after a storm when you don't have that kind of light. And um, and all the, basically any of the mountain scenery, I had to just climb some rock because the, the wind would be so unstable. It would hit, hit a shelf and do all these eddies. And I tried to run a kite and it would just do these weird dancing things. And it worked really well on these open plains, but in the mountains you just can't run a kite. Um, the volcano was a little different. I tried to photograph the plume, and I just couldn't get. That was that's a whole other story. But you need you need space to be able to run around and and let line out if the wind gets stronger, or pull it in if it dies out. And try, trying to do that at the lip of this old crater, <laughs> that was a sketchy idea. <laughs> um, and because basically, if you have enough wind to lift the camera it's too strong for you to actually pull back. And so typically what you would do is you'd find a fence post, you tie off your line, and you walk it down. And so on the edge of this cliff, you don't, you know, there's nothing to tie to except really sharp rocks which are going to cut your line. And if the line goes down, there's, you can't follow it down the cliff. So it, yeah, it just took a long time. And, and uh, I definitely wish I had other tools sometimes. But it's fun to, I mean, it's, it, it fits this space sometimes really well too, because you can fit it with you, you can, t you can deploy it whenever you want. Um, you, you, I wouldn't have been able to get that close to sheep and cows with a helicopter or with an airplane. <laughs> so there's this little, like for low altitude stuff in a high windy place yeah, that's open, it's great. <laughs> uh, you had that kite at Cal Day, right? Wasn't that the kite that Yes, was? yes, that was the one that was up. That's now in mission somewhere. <laughs> I left them a note. They haven't called me back yet. I know whose roof it's on. Oh. Yeah, I have to get a new one of those. Do you practice a lot? Kite flying? No. So that was the thing. I had I bought this thing six months before I left. I had the plan of like testing it out at the Berkeley Marina, which yeah. is a fantastic place Kite to fly place, kites. Yeah. And I flew it twice without the whole setup. I didn't have enough time to build the whole setup. So I built this whole thing and I tested it at Eileen's field site. Yeah. And I had all kinds of problems and John was helping me troubleshoot things. I was pretty sure it wasn't going to work. I was prepared <laughs> to not have aerial pictures. I thought, I'll bring all this stuff. If I have time to mess around with this, I'll do it. And I messed around with it, and it worked surprisingly well. And it was surprisingly robust. I mean, that thing came down pretty hard sometimes when the wind died, and I couldn't pull in the line fast enough. Or I was dancing around and shooting off little parts all over the place. <laughs> and, and the thing is, it's so lightweight that when it comes down, the whole frame just deforms instead of breaking, so you can kind of just push everything back together and it still works. <laughs> so, yeah, I was amazed how well it worked and how well all the electronics and stuff worked. So, I kind of got lucky that I didn't, I went into a blind and it worked out. Any yeah. additional questions right now? All right, let's thank him again for